is my great pleasure to introduce to you the conference's um, second uh, keynote speaker, right? Um, Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock, who is professor um, at Central Michigan University uh, and an associate editor of the Journal of the Fantastic in the Arts. Um, he's the author or editor of 19 books. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you uh, the whole list. Why not? Uh, why not? Because I don't have it here. <laughs> <laughs> um, these include uh, The Age of Lovecraft, University of Minnesota Press 2016, Goth Music from Sound to Subculture Television, uh, Palgrave 2016. Uh, two books in one year. Free. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> At the present, he's a uh, com uh, he's completing a work on the Cambridge Companion to the to the American Gothic, co-editing a collection on Satan and Cinema. Oh my God, the Satan and Cinema, the sound of it. <laughs> um, and working on a book addressing mat mat materiality and the Gothic. His latest publication is Return to Twin Peaks: uh, New Approaches to Materiality, Theory, and Genre on television, Palgrave 2016, uh, and uh, if we are to believe um, his students, uh, uh, he is uh, brilliant and funny, uh, because I actually looked at um, a website where the um, students sort of give grades and make comments. Uh, yeah, so in Poland, there's at least two such. Um, actually, on one of them, they, they also evaluate how handsome uh, the, the, uh, the teacher is, yes. Uh, um, not in that case, though. Uh, um, uh, the, only, the only thing um, some students complained about was uh, 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 that uh, Professor Weinstock is a bit too demanding. Okay? <laughs> the requirements are pretty, uh, uh, you know, solid. Um, all right, so please welcome uh, DJ Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock. <laughs> I wish to start by thanking the University of Silesia, the Institute of English Cultures and Literatures, and most especially uh, Carolina and Anya for inviting me and having been such wonderfully gracious hosts. I'm honored to be involved with the proceedings, so thank you very much. Despite the work that I do with film, I have a somewhat vexed relationship with Technology. I operate on the assumption that it is going to fail me at some point through the course of the presentation. So we'll keep our fingers crossed because there is both a PowerPoint and then about a four minute clip of the film from The Cabin in the Woods that I hope to show. So hopefully all of this will function. If not, I'm going to scream Pavel <laughs> who will come to the rescue. The first part of the talk is called Rummaging Through Horror's Cellar. Early in Drew Goddard's 2012 horror film, The Cabin in the Woods, with screenplay by Joss Whedon, as part of the Whedon verse, and Drew Goddard, five American college friends, Dana, Holden, Marty, Jules, and Kurt, arrive at the eponymous cabin in the woods where they intend to spend a relaxing weekend. Predictably, and stupidly, entering the basement after the cellar door ominously springs open on its own, they find a bizarre conjuries of curious artifacts including a music box, a necklace atop a wedding dress, drums, a puzzle sphere, an amulet, a ceremonial dagger, a telescope, a gas mask, a toy chest, doll masks, and a diary. And for those who are fans of the film or are interested, there is a Cabin in the Woods Monster Items Wiki available online. It gives you the complete catalog of all the items that are supposedly available in the basement. I'm now going to show about a four minute clip from the film. Um, the setup is that these uh, five friends have been playing a game of truth or dare. Suddenly, the trap door to the basement, and this is one of many references to the Evil Dead films, um, swings open on its own. And of course, being the type of film that it is, they decide that they must investigate what's in the basement. So good? Thank you. 
going on? Uh, that makes what kind of sense? What do you think's down there? Why don't we find out? Dana. I dare you. setting in these items, an almost palpable aura of dread. The music is low and ominous, as first a flashlight and then a lantern give us only passing glimpses of the cellar's contents, which seem to mesmerize all the kids except for the, the stoner of the group, Marty, who, sensing something wrong, suggests with increasing urgency that they all go back upstairs. What we later learn is that all of the items serve as summoning artifacts to be used in the ritual. An annual ceremony humanity must perform to placate the ancient ones, monstrous Lovecraftian entities that must be entertained with scenes of blood and sacrifice to ensure humanity's continued existence. Each artifact correlates with a particular monster and, when handled, summons that creature. Then if things go as scripted by a shadowy organization overseeing events, the summoned creature dispatches or devours the unlucky summoners, and humanity gets to survive for another year. With a measure of redundancy to ensure satisfactory completion, these events take place at the same time in various locations around the world. 
observing a kind of perverted reality TV show via hidden cameras, rather than survivor, let us call it victim, the organization has a whiteboard in its underground bunker listing the monstrous possibilities that may be summoned and place wagers on which creature will be activated. It's also become a kind of game on the part of fans and viewers to try to correlate the monsters in the, with the object in the cabin cellar. Connections triangulated through the history of horror, which provides the context for the associations. Horror aficionados will immediately recognize the elusive qualities of many of the cellar's artifacts, and will thus make the connections between cellar and whiteboard. Some are very specific such as the puzzle sphere that summons Fornicus, Lord of Bondage and Pain. An obvious allusion to the puzzle box in the Hellraiser films and to Pinhead, the chief demon that it summons. The necklace atop the wedding dress summons the bride, presumably a reference to 1972's The Blood Spattered Bride. The doll masks seem to allude to the antagonists of the 2008 film The Strangers and the zombie redneck murder family, summoned by the diary of Patience Buckner, derives its inspiration from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre with a kind of George Romero twist. In contrast to the specificity of these monsters and references, some of the objects and creatures with which they correlate are more generic. The conch shell summons Merman, a creature from the Black Lagoon type monster, the music box apparently summons the Sugar Plum Fairy, a monstrosity seemingly inspired by Guillermo del Toro's creations as filtered through Black Swan. The amulet summons a werewolf, the fortune-telling machine an evil clown, the unicorn tapestry, curiously a unicorn, um, and then there's Kevin. <laughs> And we're not exactly sure who or what Kevin is. No. Taken together, however, with the artifacts in the cellar, both specific <coughs> and generic, and the film more generally finally summoned, is the horror genre itself. The artifacts are an important part of what writers Whedon and Goddard describe as their, quote, loving hate letter to the current state of horror, as the film, quote, takes jabs at various tropes and cliches within the genre, while simultaneously paying homage to them. Indeed, the film is insistently metatextual, as it playfully combines and parodies elements abstracted from what we could refer to as the horror film megatext. It's not only full of allusions to other works, with a particular fondness to Sam Raimi's Evil Dead films, which are referenced throughout, starting with the title, The Cabin and the Woods, but at times it goes further to offer playful explanations for the poor decisions made by horror film protagonists the reason they invariably split up when staying together would be safer, for example, has to do with chemicals pumped in by the historic, mysterious organization staging the scenes. Similarly, protagonists drop weapons after using them once when it would make much more sense to hold onto them because of an electric shock the items produce. While the cabin in the woods provides a lot of fodder for discussion, and we could pursue this much further during the discussion period, I'd like to focus on the cellar full of cursed objects in the cabin in the woods, because what this kind of horror film basement sale helpfully highlights is the Gothic's deep, affective investment in material things, fantastic materials that are anything but passive and inert. Were we to rummage even deeper in the cellar, no doubt we would find a creepy portrait with eyes that move, a figure that ages, or that perhaps steps down from its frame. We might uncover a magic mirror with a sticky surface that stretches when touched, and that functions as a window or a portal into another dimension. We would come across a voodoo doll, or a mysterious idol, a marionette imbued with the will to do evil, or a hateful talky Tina doll, a manic wind-up monkey toy with clanging cymbals. Perhaps in addition to Patience Buckner's diary, the unhappy artifact accessed by the cabin crew that summons the redneck zombies, we might uncover another volume of accursed lore, a skin-bound grimoire such as the Necronomicon, or the King in Yellow, or the Babadook. And if cabins in the woods had garages, 
No doubt there would be a malevolent 1958 <coughs> Ford Fury named Christine parked there. What the Cabin in the Woods does, I would like to suggest, is to pack the cellar with the fantastic materials of the Gothic itself. Material objects that defy our conventional expectations about how things should act. They are mysterious, cursed, and often seem to possess agency, a will of their own. They are uncanny in the Freudian sense of seeming to confirm superstitious belief. And as they act, they transform the Heimlich into the unheimlich. The homely becomes unhomely as cellar becomes crypt. To borrow from object-oriented ontologist Quentin Milasso, and to foreground my direction with this essay, these Gothic objects thrust us into the great outdoors. Move us beyond correlationalist perspectives that insist that if things exist, they do so purely for us, and into a stranger world full of what Jane Bennett refers to as vibrant matter. Gothic things are things that call into question human understanding and mastery of the world. Indeed, Gothic works often stage a curious kind of inversion as things become lively and animate while human beings are reduced to passive, inert objects through paralysis, confinement, dismemberment, and death. Put differently, Gothic things are to varying extents hyperbolic and nightmarish representations of new materialist claims about the nature of all objects, and they thereby recast new materialism as a kind of horror story. The section is on new materialism now as horror story. The impetus for the project I'm currently working on, that I'm calling Gothic Things, was another category of uncanny phenomena, deja vu, the experience of having heard it all before. As I began to school myself on the set of loosely affiliated theoretical approaches that get grouped under the rubric new materialism, so including object-oriented ontology, speculative realism, weird realism, and the like, it all seemed strangely familiar. I started with Jane Bennett's Vibrant Matter, a political ecology of things, and didn't get past the first page of the preface before the creepy feeling of having heard it all before, but in a different register, started to steal over me. Bennett's project in Vibrant Matter is to challenge the, quote, habit of parsing the world into dull matter, it and things, and vibrant life, us, beings, and thus to reveal the ways in which things are vital players in the world. This is something she suggests we already know, but have forgotten from childhood experiences, quote, of a world populated by animate things rather than passive objects, unquote. To recover this sense of vital materiality, according to Bennett, is an important step toward a more ethical engagement with the world that may prompt, quote, the emergence of more ecological and more materially sustainable modes of production and consumption, unquote. Toward this end, Bennett emphasizes, quote, what is typically cast in shadow, the material agency or effectivity of non-human or not quite human things, unquote. I don't know about you, but I can remember childhood experiences of a, quote, world populated by animate things rather than passive objects, of shirts on hangers that in the dark could become floating human forms of closet doors that needed to be closed tightly to ensure that they wouldn't open on their own, compelled by something from within, of stuffed animals or dolls that would stare down from shelves. My own experiences, or at least suspicions of the material agency of non-human or not quite human things that lurk in the shadows as a child, were far from pleasant. And as Freud points out in The Uncanny, through reference to the automaton Olympia, mistaken by the protagonist Nathaniel in Hoffman's short story, The Sandman, mistaken as Rio, and as Masahiro Mori develops more fully with the notion of the uncanny valley, the not quite human is the class of object most prone to inspire uncanny feelings of dread. Are there any things more apt to inspire nightmares of animate things than ventriloquist dummies, marionettes, and other not quite human approximations of the human form? Bennett's vital materialism as a kind of gothic tale then continued for me in the first chapter of her study where she introduces the notion of thing power. So revisiting a topic that was actually introduced yesterday. 
thing power, the curious ability of inanimate things to animate, to act, to produce effects, dramatic and subtle. To develop this idea, Bennett foregrounds the moment when, quoting W.J.T. Mitchell, quote, the object becomes the other, when the sardine can looks back, when the mute idol speaks, when the subject experiences the object as uncanny and feels the need for what Foucault calls a metaphysics of the object, or more exactly, a metaphysics of that never objectifiable depth from which objects rise up toward our superficial knowledge. For Bennett, this moment when the sardine can looks back and the mute idol speaks occurred while she was out walking one sunny morning in Baltimore, Maryland and encountered a tangle of objects on a storm grate. This tangle consisted of one large men's black plastic work glove, one dense mat of oak pollen, one unblemished dead rat, one white plastic bottle cap, one smooth stick of wood. Bennett writes that she was struck, that's her word, by this assemblage of objects that she describes as vibratory, quote, at one moment disclosing themselves as dead stuff, and at the next as live presence. Junk, then plant. Inert matter, then live wire. <coughs> this assemblage of items, glove, pollen mat, dead wrap, bottle cap, stick of wood, which became other, sounds like the raw materials for a short story, possibly a work of mystery or horror. One could imagine these items as an inventory of clues, or perhaps, were one Stephen King, even a cabin in the woods scenario in which each summons some dreadful creature from the storm drain below. To narratize them, however, is to render them significant in human terms, to attempt to domesticate their strangeness, to make them meaningful for us. Bennett's point, which is also that of object-oriented ontologists such as Ian Bogust and Graham Harmon, to whom I'll turn in just a minute, Bennett's point is that objects invariably exceed these human frameworks for the constitution of meaning. They are more than simply passive inert substances on which we impose significance. Referencing Bruno Latour, Bennett regards them as actants, or in her parlance, agents. Taken individually, as well as an assemblage, glove, pollen mat, dead wrap, bottle cap, and stick of wood possess force. The capacity to surprise us, to captivate us, to resist us. They invariably exceed any significance we can impose upon them. What Bennett provides with her glove, pollen mat, dead wrap, bottle cap, and stick of wood is what Ian Bogus refers to playfully in his book, Alien Phenomenology, or What It's Like to Be a Thing, as a Latour litany, a list of, in Bogus' words, surprisingly contrasted curiosities that exemplify the idea of a flat ontology, a philosophy of, a philosophy of being in which all things are equal in existing. Levy Bryant refers to this as a democracy of objects. Bennett interweaves direct products of human labor, bottle cap, glove, with aspects of the natural world, pollen mat, dead wrap, stick, and there's no distinguishing among levels of consciousness or feeling. A bottle cap is every bit as much a thing as a dead rat. This does not mean that things all mean the same. The individual items of Bennett's litany and the assemblage as a whole will affect and signify differently to different people. In terms of existing, however, they all exist equally. There's a danger here, however, in a kind of aestheticization of matter that elides the differences between and among classes of objects and potentially reduces human beings to the status of things no different in type than other things. What if the dead rat was replaced by a human corpse? Perhaps like Laura Palmer from David Lynch's Twin Peaks, found by the shore, wrapped in plastic. Is it ethical to ally the difference between corpse, pollen mat, and glove? Should we consider these objects as equal and existing? Or to take another grotesque example from Lynch, this time from Blue Velvet, what if the assemblage consists of a severed human ear found in a field? Can we, and should we, consider the ear as part of a democracy of objects that, as Ian Bogost explains, quote, makes no distinction between the types of things that exist and treats all equally, unquote. To be fair, 
Bennett, in making her case for the ethics of what she calls vibrant materialism, is at least somewhat sensitive to the implications of numbering human beings among other things. To counter ethical concerns, she frames this move not as a reduction, but rather as an elevation. Quote, if matter itself is lively, she writes, then not only is the difference between subjects and objects minimized, but the status of the shared materiality of all things is elevated. All bodies become more than mere objects, as the thing powers of resistance and protein agency are brought into sharper relief, unquote. Human beings are not reduced to being things like dead rats or pollen mats. Rather, human beings share with these other objects certain basic properties that compel a new appreciation of the uniqueness and power of things. Bogus refers to this as wonder in alien phenomenology. Dead rats and pollen mats have their significance augmented rather than human significance being diminished. And Bennett also suggests that a, quote, touch of anthropomorphism is necessary to, quote, catalyze a sensibility that finds a world filled not with ontologically distinct categories of beings, subjects and objects, but with variously composed materialities that can form confederations. Breathing a touch of life into other things for Bennett helps to, us to engage with them in more humane and sustainable ways. But while my substitution of a human corpse into Bennett's <coughs> this is a kind of thought experiment, how does the assemblage change if a human body is part of it? Can we and should we consider a human corpse as just a thing like other things? Ian Bogas explicitly takes this extra step himself. At the end of his second chapter, An Alien Phenomenology on Ontography, a kind of, quote, inscriptive strategy that uncovers the repleteness of objects and their interobjectivity, Bogast offers the following ontograph, a list of apparently random objects intended to show, quote, how much rather than how little exists simultaneously, suspended in the dense meanwhile of being. And this is his autograph. On August 10th, 1973, at a boathouse in southwest Houston, the shovel of a police forensics investigator struck the femur of one of 17 corpses excavated that week, victims of serial killer Dean Bloom. Meanwhile, 235 nautical miles above the Earth's surface, a radio wave began its course from Skylab to a parabolic radar dish antenna aboard the United States naval ship Vanguard. Meanwhile, at Royal Stadium in Kansas City, Lou Pinellas Cleet met home plate, kicking up dust <coughs> as it scored what would become the team's winning run against the Baltimore Orioles. And meanwhile, at the Trails End Restaurant in Kanaba, Utah, a bowl snuggled a half cantaloupe and butter seeped into the caramelized surface of a pancake. Where Bennett's assemblage or confederation of materialities simply provided the raw materials for narrative and then implicitly demanded that we refrain from narrativizing them. Bogust here gives us his raw materials as snippets of pre-constituted narrative. And the results, for me at least, are deeply unsettling, beginning as they do with a serial killer and ending like a scene from the program Hannibal with a weirdly eroticized scene at a breakfast table. Indeed, where Bennett invites us to construct a narrative, but then implicitly asks that we don't, Bogust's curious juxtapositions within his autograph tantalize us in a dark way with the prospect of connection and almost compel us to dig deeper, which we can do by exhuming information about the exhumation. The object-oriented, that object-oriented ontology moves us into the affective terrain of the Gothic. Triple O as a kind of horror story seems evident even from the first item in Bogost's ontograph, the body part of the victim of a serial killer. Dean Arnold Quarrel was an American serial killer who, with the assistance of two accomplices, abducted, raped, tortured, and murdered a minimum of 28 boys in a series of killings that spanned from 1970 to 1973 in Houston, Texas. Quarrel was also known as the Candyman and the Pipe Piper because he and his family owned and operated a candy factory in Houston and have been known to give free candy to local children. At the time of their discovery, 
the Houston mass murders were considered, considered the worst example of serial murder in American history. To include the femur from the body of the young victim of a serial killer indiscriminately among a list of other things and tableaus raises the important ethical question we've already begun to consider. All things may be equal in the fact of their existence. Does that, however, mean we should treat all things as equal? And I would add as a kind of aside that the other elements of Bogus' autograph almost inevitably engage the reader's intellect in seeking connections. While not the candy man, baseball player Lou Pinello was nicknamed Sweet Lou, both for his proficiency at hitting <coughs> as well as facetiously for his tendency to fly off the handle as both a player and a manager. Sweetness also seems to be a quality of the caramelized pancake surface, while the bowl that snuggles the cantaloupe seems echoed by the parabolic radio dish. There's definitely a story here <laughs> that needs to be dug out. <coughs> this consideration of new materialism has begun to assemble its own Latour litany of objects and moments. When the sardine can looks back, when the mute idol speaks, when the dead rat becomes vibratory, when the serial killer's victims are exhumed. These are all moments of the uncanny, literally in the case of this uncanny sardine can, sorry. Um, when that which ought to have remained secret and hidden comes to light, and or when our ontological grounding crumbles in the face of thing power the curious ability of inanimate things to animate, to act, to produce effects dramatic and subtle. For us to enter the affective terrain of the Gothic by way of object-oriented ontology and new materialism, however, doesn't require a corpse, human or animal. Doesn't require a staring sardine can or a speaking idol. The fundamental premise of Graham Harmon's object-oriented ontology is that all objects possess real qualities inaccessible to human perception. The object, writes Harmon in the quadruple object, is, quote, a dark crystal veiled in a private vacuum, unquote. When I stare at a river, wolf, government, machine, or army, explains Harmon, quote, I do not grasp the whole of their reality, this reality slips from view into a perpetually veiled underworld, leaving me with only the most frivolous simulacra of these entities. In short, the phenomenal reality of things for consciousness does not use up their being." Unquote. Real objects are described as always withdrawing from knowing into the shadows of the world, or the shadows of being, or an underworld where they remain as veiled dark crystals, inaccessible, to human knowledge or mastery. As Timothy Morton summarizes in Realist Magic, Objects, Ontology, Causality, quote, object-oriented rhetoric becomes the way objects obscure themselves in fold upon fold of mysterious robes, caverns, fortresses of solitude, and octopus ink, unquote. Weird realism is Harmon's name for this philosophical perspective asserting that objects recede into themselves and do not simply exist for us. The universe, as a result, is far stranger, weirder, than human beings like to acknowledge as the correlationalist human world circle in which the world is construed as there for us is revealed to be, in Harmon's words, indefensibly narrow. It's for, for precisely this reason that Harmon then turns to the fiction of H.P. Lovecraft in his 2012 book, Weird Realism, Lovecraft and Philosophy. No other writer, asserts Harmon, is so perplexed by the gap between objects and the powers of language to describe them, or between objects and the qualities they possess. Lovecraft for Harmon is the preeminent author of weird realism because his writing continually gestures towards an unrepresentable other reality beyond sensuous perception. And he does this, according to Harmon, in two ways. First, through the gap between the ungraspable thing and vaguely relevant descriptions that the narrator is able to attempt, and second, by overloading language with a, quote, gluttonous excess of surfaces and aspects of the thing. The literary world of Lovecraft is thus one, is thus 
the literary world of Lovecraft is thus one in which, quote, real objects are locked in impossible tension with the crippled descriptive powers of language. And visible objects display unbearable seismic torsion with their own qualities, making Lovecraft or Harmon the, quote, poet laureate of object-oriented ontology, unquote. And in a curious correspondence with Bennett and Mitchell, marking both the strengths and weaknesses of Harmon's approach, I think, in weird realism. This idea is illustrated through attention to a tin can. Harmon's approach in weird realism is to take passages from Lovecraft's writing to demonstrate how they exemplify triple O principles. Among the passages that he quotes from Lovecraft's Out the Mountains of Madness is this one that refers to a comical heap of tin cans pried open in the most unlikely ways and at the most unlikely places. By making, quote, the wise authorial decision not to tell us exactly how the opening of the cans occurred, Lovecraft creates a new fissure between objects and the normal way in which they are unthinkingly manipulated by us journeyman humans, quote. This is not so much the sardine can looking back as our looking at it askance or being forced to reevaluate it in a new light. This revelation of the secret life of objects pries open the universe, like a tin can, in unlikely ways. Timothy Morton speaks of it in Realist Magic as the rift, an irreducible gap between things and their appearances. This undoing of correlationalism is, for Mila so, uh, one that orients us towards what he calls the great outdoors, space-time absolutely indifferent to humanity and even to animal life. And it is this indifference that authors of weird and horror fiction, such as Lovecraft, foreground as a source of anxiety, a rebuke to anthropocentrism. Timothy Morton's rhetoric takes a decidedly gothic turn in hyperobjects when he characterizes this, this outside, this great outdoors, as a, quote, charnel ground, a place of life and death, of death in life and life in death, an undead place of zombies, viroids, junk DNA, silicates, cyanide, radiation, demonic forces, and pollution. However, the most unsettling implications from an anthropocentric perspective of the undoing of correlationalism are found in philosophical works advancing a nihilist point of view, such as those of Ray Brassier, Thomas Ligotti, and most especially Eugene Thacker. Indeed, Thacker makes the case in his In the Dust of This Planet, Horror of Philosophy, Volume 1, that horror is, quote, a non-philosophical attempt to think about the world without us philosophically as opposed to the world for us, the world in which we live, and the world in itself, the world in some inaccessible, already given state, which we then turn into the world for us. The world without us is a kind of impossible limit, the attempt to think the unthinkable, to imagine the universe without humans doing the imagining. And this third and final section is called Gothic Things. Dead rats, animate things, exhumed corpses, mysterious veiled objects, lurking shadows, staring tin cans, talking idols, the familiar become other, the uncanny, Lovecraftian cosmic dread, the rift between appearance and reality, the world as a charnel ground, the world without us. The sense of deja vu I experienced reading the constellation of approaches loosely grouped under new materialism gradually coalesced around the repetition of Gothic tropes. The materials were familiar to me because they recount the same story the Gothic has been telling for centuries. Objects have unexplored depths, withdraw, but can become suddenly vibrant. Our senses cannot be re relied upon to convey accurate information. A rift can be introduced between objects and their qualities. We can suddenly be thrust into the great outdoors as the agency of the material world catches us off guard. And what the Gothic engages head on, that new materialism more or less evades, is the intense anxiety that results from this upending of the world in the equation of human beings with things. Where Bennett sees vibrant materialism as the elevation of matter, the Gothic's materialism imagines it instead as debasement the body made a thing, 
Meat to be confined, tortured, manipulated, investigated, consumed, disposed of. In my current research, I've been considering what new materialism tells us about the Gothic, and what Gothic tells us about new materialism, and what both tell us about our contemporary moments. How do shared emphases of new materialism in the Gothic arise out of, reflect, and give shape to contemporary anxieties and desires? So I've considered this in relation to Edgar Allan Poe, who I've read as a kind of proto-object-oriented ontologist in his story, Berenice, a story about a man who becomes transfixed by his cousin's teeth. I've considered this in relation to how Lovecraft updates the Gothic's fascination with portrait, book, and castle. How David Lynch weirds material things as a central strategy of defamiliarization in Twin Peaks. And how the body for Tim Burton as something to be stretched and deformed is a site of both promise and peril. In the time that I have remaining, I'd like to focus briefly on the central role of uncanny material objects in the works of yet another contemporary shaper of popular culture, Stephen King. As the title of my talk suggests, I'll focus on needful things. But this is a consideration that certainly could be extended to other works by King. I have in mind Christine and From a View of Gate, both which focus on cars, um, as well as the status of Ray Brower's body in King's short story, The Body, which is better known to most people as Stand By Me. Now, my argument is that King's things tell the same story told by new materialist authors such as Bennett, Bogus, and Harmon. They do so in a way, however, that foregrounds both the affective anxiety elicited by the prospect of thing power, as well as the ethical stakes involved in a democracy of things, a democracy of objects, that numbers human beings among other things. Set in the fictitious town of Castle Rock, Maine, Needful Things from 1991, focuses around the opening of an unusual curio store and its mysterious proprietor, Leland Gaunt. Gaunt's shop always seems to have the precise object of each customer's desire. From a rare Sandy Koufax baseball card, no one asks for Lupinella, I suppose, uh, to a fragment of wood believed to be from Noah's Ark to Elvis's sunglasses. Uh, and King takes a, a great deal of pleasure in the book uh, in playing on references to Elvis as the king uh, throughout the work. Gaunt sells these objects at absurdly low prices, provided that customers then play some kind of prank on somebody else in the town of Castle Rock. Supernaturally cognizant of the town's feuds, grudges, and animosities, Gaunt revels in chaos and successfully sows discord until the town erupts in violence. In the end, Gaunt is defeated by the town sheriff, Alan Pangborn, who realizes that Gaunt is a demonic shyster who tempts the town's citizens into surrendering their souls, but not before Gaunt's machinations have resulted in the destruction of the town. Given how prolific and successful King has been, he has sold over 350 million copies of his works. There is a surprising deficiency of serious attention to his works, which is certainly reflected uh, with needful things. An MLA bibliographical database search focusing on this hefty novel, which sold over one and a half million copies, yields a grand total of one hit. And even book-length studies of King's fiction give it minimal attention. Heidi Strangle's 2005 book, Dissecting Stephen King, from Gothic to Literary Naturalism, for example, gives it four pages of attentive analysis. Sharon Russell devotes a chapter to it in her Stephen King, A Critical Companion, where she mainly summarizes plot, offers an overview of the characters, and addresses what she sees as being three primary themes, quote, the relationship between the individual and the community, the importance of childhood, and the destructive impact of an evil presence. While the neglect of needful things in critical studies of King might lead one to consider it as peripheral to his body of work, I'd like to suggest that through its emphasis on thing power, it's not only very much in keeping with King's oeuvre as a whole, but exemplary of the larger Gothic tradition. This emphasis on the agency of the material is signaled right from the start 
through the name of the store from which the novel takes its title, Needful Things. Part of King's brilliance in the novel is the dual meaning of the word needful, which signifies both necessary and needy. In the first sense, the things are objects needed by someone or something. In the second, the things are the subjects, themselves full of need. The novel thus takes as its focus the uncanny life that material objects assume and foregrounds the rift between their perceived and real qualities. Put differently, at the core of the novel, as in the Gothic more generally, are what one could consider magical objects. Objects with unexplored depths that act in ways both surprising and uncanny. Of the commentators on King's novel, John Sears in Stephen King's Gothic appreciates this the most. Although his emphasis is not on the things themselves, but rather on their roles in capitalist transactions. Needful Things is, in Sears' estimation, quote, King's most extended and forceful allegory of consumerism as the misdirection and corruption of desire. Sears sees the novel as critiquing Leland Gaunt's conventional capitalist philosophy that, quote, everything's for sale. As part of this analysis, Sears observes how the language of transaction and exchange permeates the novel's rhetoric and notes how the word thing, quote, circulates through this economy, accruing a range of uncanny significances. Things variously names objects and actions and people, so that needful things names both Gaunt's shop and its customers, as well as the things they buy and the lousy things they must do to pay for them. I agree with Sears that the novel functions, at least to a certain extent, as a critique of consumerism. What, however, is truly central to the novel and the affect it elicits is not just the role of objects in various transactions, but the uncanny potency of the objects themselves. Needful Things presents the Gothic's fascination with uncanny objects writ large. It focuses on and magnifies the allure of Gothicized things, things that one needs and things that have needs of their own. Indeed, a large part of the novel's early sections is devoted to detailing the odd assortment of things available in the shop. King, on several occasions, provides his own Latour litany. For example, when a central character, Polly Chalmers, first steps into the store, King writes, the items which had been placed out when Brian, who's another central character in the novel, stopped in that afternoon before, Geo, Polaroid camera, a picture of Elvis Presley, the few others, were still there but perhaps four dozen more had been added. A small rug, probably worth a small fortune, hung on one of the off-white walls. It was Turkish and old. There was a collection of lead soldiers in one of the cases, possibly antiques, but Polly knew that all lead soldiers, even those cast in Hong Kong a week ago last Monday, have an antique look. The goods were widely varied. Between the picture of Elvis, which looked to her like the sort of thing that would retail on any carnival midway in America for $4.99, and a singularly uninteresting American Eagle weather vane was a carnival glass lampshade that was certainly worth $800 and might be worth as much as $5,000. A battered and charmless teapot stood flanked by a pair of gorgeous poupées, and she could not even begin to guess what those beautiful French dollies with their rouged cheeks and gartered gams might be worth. There was a selection of baseball and tobacco cards, a fan of pulp magazines from the 30s, weird tales, astounding tales, thrilling wonder stories, a table radio from the 50s, which was that disgusting shade of pale pink which the people of that time had seemed to approve of when it came to appliances, if not to politics. <laughs> Most, although not all of the items, had small plaques standing in front of them. Tri-crystal geode, Arizona, read one. Custom socket wrench kit, read another. The one in front of the splinter, which had so amazed Brian, announced it was petrified wood from the Holy Land. The plaques in front of the trading cards and pulp magazines read, others available upon request. All the items, whether trash or treasure, had one thing in common, she observed. There were no price tags on any of them. Rocks, cameras, pictures, rugs, lampshades, baseball cards, and so on. While this scene and the others like it, that parade before the viewer, Mr. Gaunt's mis miscellaneous wares, while this occurs in a curio shop in Castle Rock, Maine, we are nevertheless back in the cellar, in the cabin, in the woods. The objects are all cursed. Patrons are manipulated by malevolent external forces, 
and the price tag for all the items ends up being the same, one soul. The objects thus become part of a cosmic battle between good and evil as they speak to human needs and desires. King's framework is more conventionally religious than Lovecraftian. Mr. Gaunt is a demon tempter who lures in the unsuspecting by preying upon their weaknesses and offering fulfillment of their fantasies. But the outcome is the same. The uncanny potency of the material world undermines human agency and thrusts us into the great outdoors. What King also makes clear in Evil Things is that the real quality of things always escape us, withdraw into the shadows. Speaking with his conscripted lackey, Ace Merrill, Mr. Gaunt muses, quote, perhaps all the really special things I sell aren't what they appear to be. Perhaps they're actually gray things with only one remarkable property, the ability to take the shapes of those which haunt the dreams of men and women. Mr. Gaunt here is an object-oriented ontologist discussing the differences between perceived qualities, objects for us, and real qualities, qualities that escape knowing and recede into the shadows. What Needful Things makes abundantly clear are the ways we invest objects with affect and meaning, transforming them into objects of nostalgia and desire for us. However, those objects always go beyond the meaning and narratives we overlay upon them. They possess the capacity to resist us, to surprise us, to act, thing power, even as they ultimately exceed and escape explanatory paradigms. What Bennett calls thing power or vibrant materialism, the Gothic figures finally as dark magic. There is, in fact, a strange inversion of Marxist economic theory at work here as the fantastic materials of the Gothic are literally invested with magical properties. They are, in fact, fetishes in the original sense of objects believed to be invested with supernatural powers. And unlike Marxian commodity fetishism that obscures the labor and social relations invested in commodity productions, these fetishes, these magic objects, working in reverse, are then used to stimulate social relations, albeit in an antagonistic way. In the end, it all comes back to the things. Whether in the cellar of the cabin in the woods or Mr. Gaunt's <laughs> curio shop, the fantastic materials of the Gothic uncover fully what is barely concealed by new materialism, cosmic dread in the face of human decentering. And Gothic things provoke the philosophical and ethical questions new materialism in the name of sustainability or eco-consciousness or post-humanism tends to sidestep. What good are qualities that can never be known? And centrally, can we and should we consider human beings as part of a democracy of things all equal in existing? Should the exhumed femur of the victim of a serial killer be lumped together with a parabolic satellite dish in a bowl of cantaloupe? How should we respond when, a, when an assemblage containing a corpse becomes vibratory? It seems to me, as it does to Eugene Thacker, I think, that it is precisely the Gothic and in particular its Latour litany of uncanny fantastic materials that is asking the difficult questions about precisely how human beings should regard and relate to the non-human and to each other. Thank you.